Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another episode of the Light Drop Podcast, where it's just two friends talking creativity and beyond. And today, we are three friends because we have a very special guest. Our guest today is someone who we've been so excited to speak with. I had the pleasure of meeting her once and in the brief time that we spoke what stood out to me about our guest today the most was the way in which she really brightens up a room you know like our our guest today is the chair of bfa animation at school of visual arts she's the co-lead of WIA's New York City chapter as well as the chair of WIA's education program and she does it all while being an independent artist across several different mediums so super excited to have our guest on the show today without further ado welcome to the pod Xiang Chinmo. Hi everyone thank you Jamil and Jeffrey for having me. Thank you. Uh, really excited to be here uh, I didn't know I would brighten up any room, but hopefully I could do that today as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm going to I'm gonna start off the first question today. I think that kind of, Jamil kind of uh, mentioned a lot. You've done a lot of things. You're involved in a lot. So we want to know, what's your art origin story? How did you become who you are today? You know, we want to know the background. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I can start off by having a confession. I actually am not an animator. Uh, I run an animation program where I have over 400 students specializing in 2D animation, but I am not an animator. Uh, my background, um, trace it all the way back. I'm originally from Taiwan. Uh, studying abroad is always like a dream of mine. And then just family arrangement, all sorts of thing. And then moved to United States, for college actually. So English, not my first language. If I count in numbers, it has to be in Chinese. So cleaning my phone number, my social security, anything numbers are related, I had to do it in, in Chinese. Um, but then when I went to college in Temple in Philadelphia, I actually was torn between biochemistry and filmmaking. Uh, my background's more in the science of uh, and I chose the filmmaking more on the editing route. And clearly my parents were a uh, little bit, not they weren't upset. They're just like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, you do you. We'll figure it out. Uh, they're really open-minded. They didn't really care what I want to do. They just want to make sure I'm doing whatever I want to do to that I'm happy about. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in undergrad, I was focusing a lot more on just video editing, specifically for documentaries. And uh, then I went to SVA for grad school and still had the goal of my own documentary that I wanted to make. Um, but then my career, if you summarize it, I, how I got to where I am, is all the people that I met kind of make up what I do now. And so I don't, I didn't really get to decide what I want to do, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so in grad school, uh, it was a four semester study. The second semester, I actually got approached by a faculty and say, hey, do you want to work part-time with me for something? I was like, cool. I don't know what that is. I will say yes. And I became a production assistant for motion capture. And this is too many moons ago. The system looked really outdated compared to now. Um, but I had no 3D experience. I didn't really know anything about rigging. I didn't really know anything about systems in general. So I was just kind of got thrown into fire and learn on the job. Um, then fast forward, I then shift, shift to higher education to be in the, uh, on the admin side. Uh, I started from an admin assistant, like running the library, helping students with classes and start getting my toes into like curriculum, curriculum development. And then, uh, I was very fortunate that in the four, uh, the first six years in higher education, I became admin assistant and became a director of operations. Um, but then throughout that journey, this is where things got really interesting that I started going to a lot of conferences and festivals and animation adopted me in the way that all the people I met from all these places 
started giving me a lot of ideas and information and knowledge about how animation industry works. And at the end of the day, I think you will both agree. It's all about people. It's all about networking and connections. And I feel like they all took me in, even though I have no idea what it is. I will go to a tech talk and see graph about the snowflakes of frozen, how it's invisible, but there's a whole formula they need to come up with. And I was sitting there, I don't know what you're talking about. Sounds amazing. (laughs) Um, So then, um, 2018 is when I applied for this position. 2019 is when I started a job of being the chair for the animation department. And also the same year when I joined the board for VIA, uh, overseeing the education program. So I'm not a cult lead for the New York City chapter anymore. I actually had three amazing cult leads. They're running the chapter. I'm more on the advisory side of it to kind of help them move things forward. So if you said, you know, I always describe, I don't really know what I do, but if I have to put a label, I'm like intersection between animation education. Uh, but really what I appreciate, what I enjoyed the most is making that connections of people that I'm meeting, people that I, I can help with, you know, having that connections and making my world bigger and bigger by including so many other people. So so I don't really have an art journey, but I do actually. I ha- I should say also this, that I... I'm a filmmaker on my own. I can also admit that I haven't done anything about that on, on my own, just because the other things have been kind of consumed my life a lot more. Um, but I am still artist at heart. I still a storyteller. I'm helping my students to tell their stories and sometimes make me feel like I want to, you know, that little part of me, like I want to do it on my own too. I'll get back to it. I promise. No, that's, that's great. We love that. We, I love that you said that so much of this is about people. I think after, I'm, I'm more of a junior artist, just to give you a little bit of background. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. definitely more of a junior artist, um, junior mid, I would say. Uh, I graduated in 2019 mm-hmm. and I was so nervous about what what do I do now? Like, am I gonna be able to figure out what, how to move forward? Um, because I felt like I graduated too late. But the mm-hmm. thing that kind of kept me motivated and going was the people, whether it was you know, like my wife encouraging me, Jamil talking to me constantly, just pouring into me, um, my friends. And that's what helped revitalize some of that spark that I had yeah. when I first started. Um, so I really appreciate you saying that so much of this is about people because Jamil and I talk about that constantly. <laughs> yeah. And I also sometimes I feel like it's not the people that you share the same passion. Sometimes meeting people with completely different views and have a disagreement with actually helps a lot and kind of motivate me. So in my career, there are definitely people have told me in my face, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to do what you're going to do for different parts of the stage of my life. And mm-hmm. um, I could have taken the route and feeling defeated, but in the, I don't know, there's a little part of me. There's a lot of parts of me. Now, you know, <laughs> there's a little part of me. Uh, I always take that as a motivation that I'm going to prove you wrong. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I do think, you know, having that network of people with the support system, it helps. Yeah. But sometimes when I tell students is I don't want them to fall into the comfort zone of only yeah. hanging out with people that are alike. I want to make sure everyone's challenging themselves to experience something different, different topic, different discussion. And even having a debate, oh, having a debate would be really great. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've I've always um I've always said that like being a creative professional, um being an artist and pursuing this kind of work, um, especially when you're a student, it's really easy to to just just by the nature of graduating, right? It's like you, you go through this whole process of okay, at first I was in high school and then I tried I wanted to get to college, I did it, and then I wanted to you know, get good grades and I graduated and I did it. And it's, and it's always this, um, this very distinct kind of destination that you're trying to reach. And, and so I feel like a lot of times when we graduate, especially as artists, we have our eyes on a particular job or place that we want to kind of work at. And the thing about it is it's not, it's, you know, you know, being a, a creative professional, being an artist, isn't like a, a destination that you can kind of reach and then finally say, Oh, I, you know, I did it. Like I made it. 
right? It's like it's like you said, it's it's really like a constant kind of up uprooting of your comfort level and your comfort yeah. zone. Um, and the and the best way to do that is to talk to you know just to be talking to people, mm -hmm. communicating, um, back and forth, you know, experiencing different views, uh, and everything like that. So I love that you said that, and I know um, I'm really curious to like get your thoughts on on interacting with people in that way because you you travel all the time all over the place um, and you're speaking with students in that way. And you know what? What are some of the things that you've seen uh, from from the standpoint of being in like a, a almost a mentorship mm -hmm. kind of position um, that you've kind of adopted, um, and in the way that you are speaking with so many students often in passing, but being able to have that kind of impact on them. Like, what what are your what are your thoughts yeah. on that? And like, how that um, works? I would say I've done. So up until now, I've done so many panels and presentations, and but I also have this knowledge that I also started by not having any experience and freaking out, making notes on my notebook for every single question I have to ask, you know. So we all started off somewhere, and I think that's what I one thing I have to remind myself constantly is everyone I interact with they might present certain way with the title but they also are not necessarily introverts there's definitely the insecurity side of it so I think my point is to make sure people feel comfortable with the conversation and um I think this question comes up all the time is how do we network right this quote unquote networking is very I mean we talk about people making connection and how is it important not just in the industry, just in life in general, right? Um, but I think when people are like, oh, I don't know how to make friends, I don't know how to network. Um, I always feel like, but again, I have to say, I started from zero to where I'm right now. Um, in the beginning, I was definitely really shy. I'll go to a conference, I'll go to a festival. I was like, oh, no, 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 should I just start a conversation? What if they don't like me? What if we don't have anything in common? Um, but then I realized everyone has the same fear, to be honest. Um, even someone who has so many experiences, they will still have a little bit of doubt. So I think is it finding that common ground of we're not networking because the term networking sounds very official, very much like this is what I do. Can you help me? Or this is what you do. Can I have it? It's like a transaction almost. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I always feel like networking is something for me is just as simple as making a friend. I actually love, love, love talking to strangers because there's no, there's no baggage, right? I mean, not that you're going to make them like, I'm from, you know, Fiji. Actually, once I faked the identity, I don't know why my friend is like, there and is like, what if we walk up to someone and people ask me where we're from? We we're from Fiji. I was like, I don't even know where Fiji is, but it sounds great. Um, but I think it's just more so of meeting someone and just having a conversation. It could be animation related. It could be visual effects related, or it could just be something else. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's, it's just really dumb it down to, just having a conversation and also just like in life, you're not going to be friends with everyone. Some people just have a conversation, two or three sentences. You're like, okay, cool. You leave. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong about it. Um, but I think it's just a, being genuine about being curious of, of what other people are. The truth is people love talking about themselves. So thank you for letting me talk about myself. <laughs> um, but mostly, you know, you know, a lot of students or Emerging talent would be like, I don't know what to talk about. And then what they do is they walk up to someone with a business card, like, this is my business card. Can you check out my work? But then then you already set the tone of you want something, right? But you just walk up to someone, have a conversation and see where the conversation goes. Um, and I, I think that's where I come in as a mentor. So I have a lot of people reach out to me for advice, for different levels of industry, actually. There are definitely people like emerging talent. They're trying to figure out to break an industry. There are also people that are shifting their career. There are also people in the leadership level and trying to figure out what they are pivoting their life decisions and, you know, and all sorts of different things. Um, but I always 
I always, I'm always, always, always being really harshly honest with people just because I feel like I don't want to sugarcoat stuff. So for example, I have someone recently hop on a call with me. Um, this person was very anxious about what they want to do and what they want to want to do, what they are doing now versus what they want to do. The whole conversation, I can tell this person was nervous. And every question I asked, this person was very throwing a lot of buts and doubts. And I was like, you know what? We're not here to talk about what you do anymore. I'm here to help you to build the confidence. So, um, but again, this conversation, obviously this person came to me for advice. So I can actually break it down into, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to destroy your egos or uh, look down on your creativity. It's nothing about that. I, I see every single human being is like a beautiful person. We might share some passion about certain titles of shows and whatever, but I'm, we're here to help each other. And then so doing just conversation, I was very honest with this person like, hey, I'm going to stop you right here. Let's let's take five steps back and just like be a human being. And I want you to be confident. And then so that one hour phone call end up being like a coaching session because I want everyone to get something out of it. You know, I, I don't want to be like, oh, yeah, you're doing great. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's not helpful. Um, even Jamel, when we were meeting at that one event, a lot of students walk up to me with their portfolio to the point I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to tell you exactly what's going on. I'm not going to be like, it, your work, work is amazing. Yes, they are. But there's definitely room for improvement. And I think it's my, I choose in that position to be honest with people. So I, I am here to help, but not, but also be kind. Right. There's a verse difference between being nice and being kind. I want to be kind. Nice is more like you're you're great, but kind is more like you're good, but this is what you could do to move forward. So uh, but yeah, mentoring is is something that I do. I find myself doing a lot, but I also have to say I have a lot of mentors of my own. I can go up and ask a question about my career, my personal life, or anything that I do, or my cats, you know. Yeah. I was going to follow up with that because you mentioned that there are sometimes students will pre present their work to you and they're a little bit shy. Do you think that um, a strong portfolio but lower confidence is still enough to get through the industry? Do you think confidence is the thing that like will take your work further, even if you're not technically like the best? Because mm -hmm. um, Jamil and I have, have spoken about that in a previous episode about how um, sometimes presenting your work is more important than the actual ability because people can understand what you're trying to convey. But yeah, my question is just that, just that. do you think that someone has amazing work, obviously, but doesn't feel too confident about it, it's still gonna be all right in their work? Or mm -hmm. do you think yeah. there are challenges? Uh, so if, if the standards, like the work, it's great, I feel like, whether or not your confidence, it's more so how you present yourself. Nowadays, a lot of the work are presented without the person, right? You have your portfolio, your LinkedIn, your Instagram, whatever platform that you use to present yourself. So, but by doing so, being confident of presenting your work, that's, I think, should be the minimum because, again, you're not putting yourself like in front of people, right? So I feel like that's the first step of being confident of of presenting yourself professionally and artistically. Uh, I think that's really the bare minimum. But then if you're taking another step into um, after you present yourself, sorry, after work is presented without you being in the room and now you're having a conversation either virtually in real life and showing that confidence, I feel like that moment is not as important. It is important to present yourself professionally but being confident, I would say, is important in the way, at least having a, a decent conversation. Because you don't want to also present yourself like, I already know everything I'm doing, right? That's too confident. We don't want that either. Is having that, finding that mutual tone of how, how you want people to perceive you, right? So 
But I think if you're completely not confident of yourself and, you know, people ask, go, what about this project? How did you do it? How did you come with an idea? I think it's not about confidence. It's more so the communication skills. If you can't articulate enough about how you create, then that leads to the question is, can you communicate when you're on the job? Right. So I think confidence is more like, I feel like that's the first line. If you can or cannot do it, but I would say bare minimum, like just be confident as who you are as a human being. And then about your work, it's more about communication. So I do think at the end of the day, communication skill is way more important than your skills. Cause um, I feel like this is me personally, I feel like your skills in terms of animation or, or any skills um, that's knowledge base, you can always learn. And I didn't know anything about mocap, literally. I was like trying to figure out TCP IP, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I, can <laughs> learn, I can learn on the job. I can ask people for help. I can find a mentor. But communication, it takes practice and you need to be motivated and brave enough to do it to start. But once you start doing it, having in the practices, it should come easy. But on the other side, back to being, you know, about this network of people is I actually think a lot of emerging talents when they're not confident, I see this a lot, which is it's really cute. I love it is they don't know what to do in one on one, but they will bring a friend of theirs to come and talk to professionals so they don't feel like they're alone. And absolutely, that's great. Um, so if you feel like I, I'm, I am good at what I do, but I'm still needing that little bit of confidence boost, get a friend to help out, especially in real life. Virtually might be a little bit difficult, but like, you know, having whatever that is, it could be a friend, it could be something that you, it could help you. Um, I think that having that little bit of boost will help out. So, but do you come across... Yeah, I've noticed that too. I think you you know what I think the most is like and and you're in a really unique uh position with your perspective because it's like um it's it's cool because it's mm -hmm. your job to speak with people about how to get a job, but in doing so you're able to see how there's really not mm -hmm. much separation, right? It's like 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 you mentioned, it was like, quote unquote, your job to speak with that student that reached out to you. But then amidst that, you were like, okay, wait a minute, let's, we're talking about work and stuff here, your portfolio, but actually I can see that we need to just talk about, you know, your life and your skills. And I think, I think especially artists who tend to be on the introverted mm -hmm. side, um, I think there's almost this this attachment to that, to identifying as that. But the fact of the matter is these communication skills are no different than your skills in Photoshop and your skills in Maya. And, and you can still be an introvert, um, but practice how to communicate, right? It's, it's, I think I've noticed that about myself is that I'm definitely an introvert, but um, I always felt like I could improve the way my voice was. It's like, I wasn't comfortable using my voice. It's not that I was sh like shy, you know, or timid. It was just that literally my voice and using it was so foreign and, and it was uncomfortable. And so the only way to get out of that is to kind of practice and you can, and you can identify um, very tangible things to improve on. Like, oh, you know, I want to, I speak really low. You know, I'm, I'm, I mumble a lot. Like, let me just try and practice that, right? And speak louder. And and so, yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's a really big kind of distinction that's kind of hard to see when you're a more junior artist getting yeah. into things is, um, you know, it's it's really it's really just a habit that you've had for, for all this time of, of only speaking with your friends and people you're comfortable with. And, and you start to identify as, oh, I'm just, I'm just not good at it. No, I'm just, oh, I'm just too shy, but it's just, it's just a, a skill that you haven't developed yet. Um, and I think that on top of that, 
to realize that there isn't any separation between that part of you and your life and then your your professional side of it. It's like you said, the difference between networking and just making friends is just the intention that you have before you speak with mm-hmm. that person. You know, that's that's really the only difference. And so if you if you're approaching someone at like a, a networking event, right, then you can feel that that mm-hmm. pressure is different just just based on the name yeah. of the event, right? But if you just kind of frame it as no, I'm just here to to work on speaking to people, to meet people, you know, it's it's those genuine connections that not only um, can sh- can start to build more confidence in yourself because um, it's only through interacting with other people that you can learn more about yourself. But now that's also going to translate into your work too, and the work and the confidence that you're putting into your your creative work. So I think that that's a really interesting kind of like perspective that you kind of have to see through interacting with students in your position and everything. Yeah. I mean, one thing I also said that I mentioned English, not my first language. So if you're really breaking it down, like how to mm-hmm. learn to how to communicate. When I went to Temple freshman year, I remember my friend, uh, He's he was an architecture major. And he said, we're going to go side visit. You want to come visit? Oh, uh, come, come along and you can meet my friends. So he, he's Taiwanese and all his friends are not. Right. So I was like, yeah, of course, I just got here. I should probably go explore the city. And I went along with them for the entire day. At the end of the day, he walked up to me, just to me only after all his friends left. He's like, just curious. Um, Are you being rude on purpose? And I was like, whoa, what did, what did I do? He's like, you don't talk to my friends. You didn't, you didn't really talk to them, like communicate with them, like chat with them, like what's going on? Like, did anything do anything to you? Or like, what is it? Uh, And he came across not like being rude or anything. He just was very curious. And this is what I said to him. I need to understand what people are talking about first before I can say anything back. So like learning that English in terms of um, the, the learning art of, I need to be able to go to the event, understanding what people are telling me about I mean again I was not born a race here there's a lot of American pop culture references I still don't understand um but I think it's just then once I can understand and I can actually be brave enough to ask the questions like hey what you just said I don't know what that is can you tell me again I think a lot of people are very shy I think again I don't think this is just for ESL people it's people in general like I don't want to look not knowing enough, right? I don't want to ask questions, but just ask questions. Like, I don't know what that is. Tell me more about it. Uh, and then to the point where I was walking down the street, listening to podcasts, I was like cracking up. I was like, I can understand the jokes without like captions. My English is great now. So, you know, like I went through that, my, my young adult life to completely learning a new language. I mean, I knew English back then, but not conversational. So I think, but then my way of doing, just like you said, continue to practice, continue to practice and uh, don't be shy even in making mistakes. And one thing I encourage people to do, actually, I know it sounds really strange. Um, I think now a lot of people fall back on communicating on on social media, but that social media communication um, etiquette is very different. I still want people to go out and meet people. I always say go all out and strike a conversation with strangers because everyone has a unique stories. And so, so by asking these questions like, oh, I mean, obviously you're not going to walk up to them and be like, hey, tell me about what you do. That was a little bit weird. Um, but let's say you're sitting next to someone on the plane, on the train, uh, something happened where you start making conversation, just, you know, go along with the uh, I absolutely love talking to strangers, just hearing their life stories. And sometimes because there's no baggage, right? It's not networking. You're not getting anything out of this entire conversation. You're just literally sitting stuck next to each other on the plane. You got nothing else to do but talk to each other. People would pour their hearts and souls about their life journeys and problems. And 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 you could do the same, right? And I, I absolutely love those encounters because I feel like that's how I 
get to learn more about storytelling and how people tell their stories and and how they interact with other people. And um, yeah, I highly recommend doing that. But I actually curious, Jeffrey, do you have something? Because you're the one who brought a question about confidence. Yeah. Did yeah. you go through that journey as well? I did. I absolutely did. So I'm not, I wasn't born in the United States um, either. I was born in Kenya okay. and I moved to Georgia in 2000 when I was seven years old. And I remember first I was, I was frustrated because I was like in this new place and um, I'm still learning English. So I'm not super confident in it. Um, and just going through school, like struggling with learning from school, learning from teachers, because I wasn't really understanding things. And then um, I started playing basketball a little bit more. And that's when I had to be, I had to communicate more I had, when I was playing soccer and sports and stuff like that. Um, and then I found graphic design, which is what I landed doing, which <clears throat> I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, maybe I picked that because it's a way of communication that I understand. Uh, and now that I've started to think about that more, I've kind of realized like, I want to learn how to be a better speaker as well. Uh, because I think I used, I've used graphic design to communicate in ways that I'm like curious to actually do with my voice. Um, so yeah, that, that's been my journey with communication and confidence and still learning, but it's, it's been exciting. <laughs> but then see basketball is great though. It's like a yeah. team you're you're actually already communicating without language you're mm -hmm. like literally eye contact and like doing all the signals at yeah. home. <laughs> when, I, when i was little so we do more of that sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's what people do right <laughs> like, yeah. they, um but i think that's also great is that's a really great advice in terms of how to learn how to communicate without language because i think that's what a lot of filmmaking and stories are right you're not really telling people what to think and what to feel uh, so I think, I know, I appreciate you sharing that. I should get back to basketball. I don't basketball. know. No, <laughs> we skateboarding. Isn't that what we talked about when we were, <laughs> when we were on that panel is, um, is, is, is oh, your yeah. skateboarding. Um, yeah, I'm still doing it, but that's such a lonely <laughs> sport. I mean, it's all fighting yourself. Uh, so I started skateboarding a couple years, yeah. I mean, maybe two years, a year and a half ago. Um, I just thought it's cool. It looks cool. It's like, I'm just going to get from my apartment to the subway. That's all I wanted to do. And of course, that's not the reality. Once you start learning, everyone starts teaching all the street styles and all the, you know, all the mm -hmm. stuff. And they're like, you need to do that so you don't fall in and injure yourself. Um, but I think that is that is a communication with yourself, which is actually pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. Um I started doing it just because my life was so stressful that I was started this new job at SVA. I also started my new role with WIA where I was running multiple programs at the time. And I would wake up six o'clock in the morning during pandemic, sit on my desk till midnight, literally every single day, because I got to figure out how to run a department and doing all the programming. Uh, but then I pick up skateboarding just because I can force myself to go out not only that, the only thing I could think about while I'm skating is not to die <laughs> uh, or injure myself, you know? So I feel like that for me is still very, um, I'm setting milestones every time I go skating. I'm not really good. I'm doing stuff like little kids could do like within two weeks. I'm still like struggling. Um, but I feel like that's for me. I want to continue to do it, continue to kind of challenge myself that, okay, I know if I, I haven't been back for a couple of weeks, if I go back, I'm going to start from scratch and how far I could go. Um, so it's, it's a good journey that, uh, or like a milestone I'm setting for myself. Um, but I think everyone should have something that's not, screen-based uh any activity i think that will be helpful just for our our health in general <laughs> yeah i've been i have a i have a um a, a bet with my brother my little brother he's just turned 19. Mm. i bet him a thousand dollars that i would learn how to dunk before he could <laughs> so now <laughs> now it's on neither of us have a thousand dollars so i don't know why we both <laughs> decided to do that but after, um, I think after, oh, Jamil, Jamil's gone. Oh. He's yeah. like, I gotta go practice dunking now. 
You're back. Okay, cool. You're back. <laughs> um, but yeah, just just trying to set challenges like that for myself realistically uh, yeah. has been super helpful because I think um, just working and obviously we have all these tasks that we have to um, try and hit. I forgot that I can use that new skill that I've learned of set a set an actual goal for something that's not has nothing to do with being on a computer. It yeah. can really benefit you. So that's been my goal. I want to learn how to dunk and not yeah. pay my brother a thousand dollars. Can you can you learn how to dunk though? No. Okay. So what I'm talking about. So I'm six. I'm six four, right? Uh -huh. But I can get up there. But I want to. I want to do something nice. Yeah. Okay. You, know, like, you want to style on. Yeah. Them. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like there's like moves you can do like before you do that. Is exactly. that okay? Yeah. I want to dance in the air. I don't want to just get up there. <laughs> Yeah, see, I, got it, got I feel it. like there's, you can practice getting outside of your comfort zone with the little things, right? It's like, you don't need to feel like you need to, to, um, even, even if like getting up early in the morning was is something that you like would like to do, but you just, you just don't do it. It's like, okay, well, let me like, let me practice getting outside of my comfort zone by just I don't know, making the, making the shower a little bit colder, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like stuff like that. Like you just be creative, but like slowly you can be like, Oh, I, I did like, I did that. Like I, I didn't want to do it, but I put myself outside a little bit and like slowly and slowly you can just build that confidence in yourself mm -hmm. about like just little things getting outside of your, your comfort zone. And, and yeah, I love what you said about um, like how you took up skateboarding because when you did it, it like required your full attention and it was a, and it was almost like therapeutic in that way because uh Jeff Jeff and I had a conversation recently about um how like we we were so action oriented as a society we feel like things aren't going to get done unless we're sitting down mm -hmm. in front of the desk and and doing them you know or or writing them out or typing them out but uh the fact of the matter is you can you can really make a lot of progress um not only on yourself and in your self-confidence and and in the way that you communicate all these things that we're talking about through taking a step back and you know like you said picking up something new like like that taking your mind off of things um you know giving your giving yourself uh the time to take a take a walk and just kind of veg out mm -hmm. right without feeling like Oh man, I'm not getting anything done. <laughs> right? It's like you really are like by by kind of pursuing things that interest you that may not even necessarily be directly tied to you know furthering your career. You're still mm -hmm. you're still flexing that muscle and if you don't then you'll really lose it. And especially as artists, you can't you can't lose that part of you because then then you can start to really get off balance and off and out of whack and, and things start to become like confusing almost like, Oh, what am I, what am I doing? <laughs> you know? So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, so when I start skating, I actually have a really good friend of mine. She's a little bit older than me. She picked it up when she was like 40 years old. So she's like a little bit older. She had two kids and but she's doing like all the crazy moves. So she's my, I call her the principal of skating for me because she's the one really nurturing, not, not teach me too harshly. She's just like, you have your own pace. We're going to do whatever you decide to do. And she's, we will always kind of make up time to go skating together. Kind of like you and Jeffrey, you and your brother. Um, and I think whatever you set your mind for, uh, I do absolutely agree with you, Jamel, about, anything we do it comprises like who we are as a human being it could be an artist it could be a writer it could be anything it could just be a carpenter right um but i think having people around you to support i think that's absolutely important i don't think i will go skating on my own because i feel like if i die i just i want people to call an ambulance um but i think but you know jeffrey you have your brother uh, I'm sure Jamel, you two talk to each other. Sounds like, you know, constantly encouraging each other. I think that's so, so helpful because we, unfortunately, as much as we are surrounded by so much information and so much content, I think it makes us feel more 
lonely sometimes because you feel like it's you versus the world right if you're not in it you're not in it you're like i'm rejected mm -hmm. um but that's why i feel like having that support system around you uh could actually help so the other day this is my crazy idea i was like i know i've been traveling around but outside of you know new york and or the united states i went to a friend of mine like um can we go hiking? Uh, and they're like, what, 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 why, why, what? And I was like, I just want to be outside. I don't want to be, I want to, cause I'm, when I'm here, I'll just go to work and come back. I say, I want to be out in the nature where I don't see buildings. And these two friends just like, sure, let's go. Uh, and it was so, so helpful in the way just to kind of recharging. But at the same time, I know I'm not alone. I'm there with someone having a great conversation. We talk about cats for the most part, <laughs> but so it's nothing career related. We talk about like food we want to eat. Um, it's really, really, really helpful. And I think healthy in some way that we as individual finding that support system uh, who can be there during your difficult time, can be there during the happiest time to cheer for you and also can be there to challenge you too. I would not want my friend to challenge me on skateboarding because I'll definitely fail. But she does do that gently in, in the way that helped me out. So I do want to say, you know, as much as continue to practice, um, I think that's important. But having that support system, it's really helpful. But if I can add one more thing. So I just got by from Philly from another talk. Um, and one thing I... I so I was I was one of the panelists, but they didn't have a moderator. So obviously I volunteered. So I was like a panelist and moderator at the exact same time. And something was very interesting that came up. So one of the questions they wanted us to address is like work life balance. Mm -hmm. So there are three panelists, right? Me and two other people went down the role of the first person to talk about there's no work life balance. And the second person is the exact same thing. So by the time it got to me, I was like, the answer is there's no work life balance for the three mm -hmm. of us. Um, but the reason I said that, as this, someone just sounds like a joke, there's something we all are consciously aware and are working on. But I also realize I want to present this reality is people, when people see us on screen together or they see people on stage, they're like, oh my God, they, doc they got their lives figured out. They know exactly what they're doing. They have all the answers to all the questions. The reality is, not really. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I think we're every stage of our life we're in, we're we're be facing a different sets of problems and issues and challenges that we are constantly trying to figure it out. And I think that's what I, it's just something interesting I've observed because students are like, oh my God, how do you do that? And, you know, how did you solve this problem? You know, being an Asian American, you know, how do you deal with difficult situations? I'm like, you know what? I'm still dealing with it. I don't have the answer, but I know how I am dealing with it. I'm sharing with you from my perspective. Doesn't mean that's the right way to do it or the only way, but also, we're still trying to figure it out as much as you are trying to figure out we're in it together. So mm -hmm. do you feel that same way? Sometimes people will put you on that pedestal and like, yeah. you got to figure it out, right? I, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say, um, like my brother, for sure, he I try and tell him that constantly that um, I because I, I used to think that when I became an adult, uh, when I was you know, 21, I guess I would know everything about real estate, the houses, the market, uh, investing. I'm like, every single day I wake up, there's something new I'm supposed to be <laughs> learning about. So, um, but I definitely do. I, I did feel that pressure when I was, I was like, I need to know what I'm supposed to be knowing all the time. So I'm just, I'm lucky that, you know, I have a partner who does it who also feels the same way that we're still figuring out so much um so whenever i talk to my brother i tell him that like adults are lying we don't know what we're doing <laughs> we're just <laughs> we're just guessing <laughs> so calm down yeah i think i think what's been cool for me is like especially over the past oh man what's it been like five months or so since we started doing this podcast is just through the conversation you realize how much you, you've been kind of processing and thinking about. And then when you talk about it, you're, you, it's almost like 
you have this conversation back and forth. You're like, oh man, I kind of like, I, I do think I kind of got it figured out. And I'm like, or from the standpoint of like, I'm thinking about it, but then you go back, you know, we, we do this podcast once a week and then the week in between, I'm just like, damn, we just talked about this, but, and yet I'm, and yet it's like, I didn't even, <laughs> it's like, I'm not practicing what I'm preaching. You know, I'm still like, I just talked about, okay, it takes this to like relax yourself. And then two days later, I'll find myself like stressed out about the thing I was just talking about. So I think, um, like you said, having, having someone to talk to about it, um, can, can almost hold you accountable to yourself. Like, from the standpoint of you're like, you're talking about these things, you're really thinking about these things. And then as they show up again in your life, it's like, okay, let me make the, let me make the determination now to like, to straighten this out a little bit. And then you just do a little bit at a time. Like, okay, I, I've been, I've been a little bit bad about this or a little bit lax about this. Let me try and tighten this up. And then, you know, slowly, but surely you start to kind of like polish, um, the way yeah. you are, um, and I think that's kind of like just different perspectives. You know, you got the students who look at who look at someone who's thirty, like they're ancient. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then now I'm just like, oh, I'm looking. At, I'm like, I still don't know anything. Like, <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out, and then that's beauty of it, right? Yeah. If we ever get to the point we know everything we know exactly what we do and how the world functions and there's no secrets and i think that's the fun of it there's a lot of mysteries and a lot of challenges and um i, I do think this is actually a good leading point to like troubleshooting i think a lot of people tend to fall back in their comfort zone like this is the way i've been doing it and that that's the only way uh or when they're presented a question um I mean, we're so easy to just like Google it right now, right? Uh, so like finding that answer so quickly, but I think it's really the process of troubleshooting is really important. Sorry, I'm going to drop a really big bomb, you know, the AI tool sets, you know? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I know it's a topic that, you know, we, we can talk about it for like five different episodes, um, but I think the tool sets, it's about, uh fast tracking right you you get from point a to point c so quickly that you the b is invisible right um but i think that's where we are society we want everything so fast to the point you neglect the process and i think now as an educator what i really want the students to focus on is the society unfortunately we still care so much about who wins the races who gets the final results, what's the end product gonna look like, right? Unfortunately, I don't think that society, that aspect would change, but us as a human being, as a creator, or just human in general, is looking at the process equally important to the end results. So I, you know, having that process in the middle documented, uh, knowing what to do, knowing what the problems are, how to troubleshoot, you know, like Jamel, like in talking about starting a podcast, you run into all these issues and how do you troubleshoot? I'm sure finding the platform, you know, all of that is part of the process to make it the way you want it to be. And I oftentimes, unfortunately, I, again, it's not just students. Everyone is like, I just want to write the social media caption. Maybe I'll just go to chat GPT and like, write this for me. Yes, you could do that. The tools are out there, um, but how are you using it responsibly? Still maintain your own voice and also learning the process of troubleshooting. I think that's very important just so we don't just, you know, skip ahead. Yeah. Sorry, that's my AI bomb. <laughs> no, I, I'd like to add to that for sure. I, I shared this article with Jamil uh, a few weeks ago about this artist and he was he was kind of putting, he was trying to debate that, you know, as artists there, obviously we have these AI tools, but the thing that people have always liked to see in other human beings is when we mess up or when we, um, when we fall and we get back up. So the artist used like Messi, for example, like the soccer player, he's, he's kind of unpredictable the way he moves. And obviously soccer is a game of you know, either you, you win or you lose and people like to see that. So that's, yep. 
that's very encouraging for artists. I think as we move forward and there's always going to be a new tool that makes the work faster, but, um, I think it's important to remember that we've always just liked the human part of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it just keeps me, I don't know, super, my, my stepdad always tells me, he's like, oh, the AI is coming to get your jobs. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, I, I, don't I think, think so we're in a really unique situation where like artists were also like we're the artists and we're creating it but we're also the consumers too and it's like what do i want to see you know i want to see something that's got emotion tied to it um i want to know that whoever wrote this like you know it's like it's not necessarily the 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 product or the words that i'm reading it's like sometimes when you know that the the words that you're reading off of a page like you can imagine the art the the writer sitting down in like a tough situation or, or whatever it was that they were going through like if you can kind of like put yourself there like that's that's what we look for in storytelling like you said or like filmmaking it's like mm -hmm. it's it's that it's being able to transport yourself to the emotion that was behind it you know and i think that uh the biggest thing that's come out of the ai boom has certainly been um like almost kind of snapping us out of that trance of like like really remembering like no that's like you know that's that is what i want to look at like i don't want to look at anything else i want to look at that kind of stuff you know so yeah like you said the ai the ai bomb we could go off on a tangent for another 40 <laughs> sorry 40 episodes on that but <laughs> yeah i mean ai is also unfortunately jeffrey i think your stepdad is right ai mm -hmm. has been replacing jobs already and that's just the reality i think for us to, to even have that debate it's it's long gone um but i think to be honest like i actually been sharing those thoughts with so many people every time i get into the ai conversation is um I'm actually not afraid of us being creators uh, using that tools correctly because we know how our unique voices and how we can edit it and make it our own if you're exploring it, or it while understanding the ethical issues involved, right? So that's, I feel like I'm not worried about it because I think people are very vocal about their opinions and there's still a long way to go for the tools to be right right? Socially, economically, responsibly, right? However, my biggest fear is the general public. The general public that doesn't care about what tools are being used. Um, and they, so for example, there's so many AI tools, you can upload your video, they'll do the whole lip sync for you. And for us, it was like, well, you're replacing all the jobs. Great. That's on the creative side of the question, right? To, to, to be worried about. General public, they just want to use it, put it on social media. Look what I did. Right. So, and I think that's my fear is, is Jamil, you actually said a really good point earlier that we're not only creative, we're also consumers. We have double roles and I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about general public. They're only consumers. Once they are so used to certain style generated by AI, and that's the only style they want or they prefer, they will shift entire industries for creating content more like that. Mm. And that's where my worry goes is, is really because can general public tell the difference between an AI gen image versus a Photoshop that we created? I don't, probably not. Do they care? Probably not. Do they care about the ethical, ethical issues involved? Hopefully, yes, but probably not, right? So what I'm worried about is the general public of wanting more content to be like that. So for example, um, vertical video did not exist until this whole thing came out. Now everything's vertical. Now every shooting video is video uh, in vertical. Game designs are all in vertical, right? So it's shifting to how the content's created because the general public are consuming certain way. And that's where my worry is. I don't have an answer for it. I'm so scared because I feel like, I, hopefully not. I, I do think 
uh, you all said a good point about that personal uh, human touch of emotions involved that AI does not have at the moment. And we as a consumer still have to be responsible for learning how to edit. But on the other side, how do we make sure everyone is aware of the same issue that we're encountering as well as care about it? Because if you don't, they don't care. Yeah, I think, I think that, that um, I think, I don't know. I'm, I've always been hopeful in that. I think that, I think that, um, you know, we'll kind of surprise ourselves. Cause I think like the other thing, the other thing that you can kind of compare it to is like the slow rise of, um, like AR and VR. And mm -hmm. I, the way I've always looked at that is like, personally, it's not for me from the standpoint of like, I just, I prefer the real thing, like, right. Like that's my, mm -hmm. that's my preference. I don't want to have something on my head, even, even if 10, 15, 20 years later, you know, it's, it's as simple as like a contact lens, right? Like some black mirror stuff where you've got, where mm -hmm. you've got this virtual reality thing that takes you away from actual reality. I've always felt like, um, like people can do that on their own and it doesn't impact me. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of how I felt about that technology. So when I think of um, what you said about how like the consumers who want to, um, who, who are preferring AI created things and then gradually that's what we see more and more of to cater towards them. Um, it's the same thing in that like, it doesn't impact what I like, I can still choose to watch something different. But I think the only the only thing like like with that mindset, the only thing that that stays scary about it is livelihoods, right? Because because people have built up careers and stuff like that. It's like, okay, well, that's great and all sure, you know, I can just choose to watch something else. But then what am I, you know, how am I going to make a living? Um, and I think that that's where the that's where the the apprehension comes from, particularly from people who've been in the industry for a while already and and have built livings and everything like that. But um, at the same time, it's kind of like what I mentioned. I feel like I'm in the middle of that, where it's like I've been in the industry for a while, but I've also I've also um, not been in the industry for nearly as long as so many other people. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like this hunkering down of like, what do I really kind of uh, want for myself as far as being able yeah. to like be satisfied with the work that I'm doing while still mm -hmm. being able to to make a livelihood. And, and like you said, we don't have the answers for that yet as far as making mm -hmm. a living goes, but I do think that just from the human side of things, um, if you can just kind of really sit down, have a have a conversation with yourself, with friends like this, and really figure out what it is yeah. that like, you know, because the reason we want anything, the comfortable livelihood career is because we think we'll be satisfied and happy and, and comfortable with mm -hmm. it. So it's like, um, what are the things um, about that, that I'm looking for? And how can I position myself to be able to always have that regardless of what's happening with with the AI, you know, conversation and everything. So that's always been my take. Again, I don't have, <laughs> I don't want to act like I have answers for those questions, but that's kind of been like my, my thought process on them. But I think also how pandemic fast track so many things and, you know, having online presence and this is why I feel like we are having these Zoom meetings and, you know, I can hop on a call and we're, you know, teaching online, all of that, you know, the technology allowed us to do that, kind of like the tool sets, right? But then I, that's why I want to always encourage everyone, including myself, go outside, go outside and meet people. Like, you know, you're saying, have a conversation, like touch the grass, yeah, go dunk something, <laughs> do the moves. And because uh, I think, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of the tools are the tools, right? But you still need that human connections. And, and I'm so afraid people are, especially they're people like playing games all day long or talking to people online. And my friend was telling me the story. She has like a five-year-old. They went out for a play date. All the kids brought their iPads. 
for the play day. And once they put the iPads away, all the kids just sit there and just like, I don't know what to do. Uh But but, uh, but again, that's just a, that's the generation now, right? They're so used to that technology, but then other people around having a discussion, having a conversation, acknowledging this is where we are right now, but also making sure that the human connections are there. Take the iPads away, get the kids, like throw them to the playground, right? There are definitely places they can have fun, run around and scream and, you know, and I still think, think that's so important. And I think I am, I'm not being negative about anything. I just, I'm, that's my own personal fear, but I'm still feel like hopeful that the human touch human emotions. And that's what drives us to move forward uh, without it. You know, there's nothing. So let's go out, have coffee. Let's do that and talk to strangers. <laughs> I love that. That's yeah. a, that's a good way to, I think after speaking about AI, the one thing I'm thinking about right now <laughs> is that question. Yeah, our lighthearted question <laughs> of the day. <laughs> I, I do have one thing though, before we, before we jump into that, to a little bit of a, a lighthearted vibe to maybe wrap up, yes. wrap up the pod. Um, you mentioned a couple of times you went to school in Philly. I grew up right across the bridge in Cherry Hill. So I'm curious. Oh. I'm curious to know how you thought about Philly. I always say um, my my mom was pregnant with me while she was getting her master's at Temple. So I always say I technically I technically graduated from Temple as well. So, You're a baby owl. I'm mm-hmm. so curious to know just like, you know, I don't know. I feel like this is just me being biased on the show. People don't talk about Philly enough. We're so New York, New York, New York, New York. We're right down the, down the turnpike. <laughs> Uh, I, I can say I went through the same process of like, when I live in Philly, I'm like, oh, I just want to go to New York. Right. I grew, I was born and raised in Taipei, which is kind of like New York. So a very fast pace and public transportation is everywhere. There are people everywhere. Um, I would say my first impression of Philly was the Philly accent was so thick. So me was not born and raised here. I remember going to someone's office, asking a question. They, they said something. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And they said it again. I'm like, can you say it again? Say it in English. Say it one more time. I'm like, oh, yeah. I was like, I don't. I'm so sorry. I thought I speak English, but I don't. I was like, it's just like freaking out. Uh, I don't want to embarrass anyone, especially myself. It was just I feel the accent was so thick. Um, but then I think my I, so I lived there for four years for college and. I would say Philly, I didn't appreciate it until I moved away, to be honest. Um, Because again, I just want to come to New York. But then Philly, I actually was very fortunate got invited to go back to Philly twice the last month for two different events. And one day, my friend who also went to Philly for college and she flew down from Boston. So we walked around. I walked at the end of the day, 36,000 steps. Wow. It was like a 13 to 14 miles of uh, just walking because mm-hmm. Philly is really walkable. Very People are generally really nice. And uh, what I love the most is the city. The vibe is calm and has history. Like New York, unfortunately, they just keep tearing stuff down, like gentrifying neighborhoods. Uh, Philly, it's not. It's still preserving that history and stories and people that I feel like it's not being neglected. And uh, food was amazing. Public transportation was great. I mean, I would say Philly has gone through a rough patches before, you know, I'm sure it still is uh, in terms of safety. I just feel like, but that's everywhere. Um, I, I was so moved when I actually got the chance to go back to Philly this time. I was like, this is my home. Like I know that building, I know that building. And I do think, Unfortunately, the industry there is not as big. Um, again, they're still focused on LA, New York, Atlanta. Um, but I'm hopeful. I don't know. Should we do something in Philly, Jamel? Is that what you're proposing? <laughs> but like I said, my biased Philly plug just to just to get some conversation yeah. about my my <laughs> my home city. You know, yeah. I always say, no, I, love- I always say Philly is like. Um, it's actually it's actually like harder to drive in in Philadelphia. Really? I think I think it's like 
I think if you can drive in Philadelphia, you can drive in New York City. It's like a cakewalk. Why? Because Why it's, because it's, it's like you said with the how they kind of have that that heritage. They haven't really torn anything down. The streets are all so so much more um, yeah. c- compact. A lot of them still have like cobblestones and <laughs> and everything going That's on. True. But then the the last thing I also love about Philly is like just that area in general is very. Um, it's like very blue collar, you know, like mm. in New York city, you have like that balance of course to like to keep the city running, but like there isn't a bunch of like glitz and glamor from the standpoint of um, like, um, like uh, people with agendas, you know, if that makes sense where they're trying to like, um, you know, progress. And like, if you're, if you're in Philly, it's like, it's cause you want to be there. And it's because um, you know, you're just, you know, you're just a regular person working and, and <laughs> enjoying stuff. So I don't know, like I said, that's just my bias, my bias mention of <laughs> Philadelphia because we <laughs> stayed there. But I think you're right. Cause I also feel like there's a huge difference between East coast and West coast. So I feel like Philly has that East coast vibe of people are really kind, but not necessarily nice, mm-hmm. but, but it's less pace not as fast as new york so you actually get to really connect with people like new york unless you fall down then people will come help but unless you fall down people are not going to talk to you uh but philly it's it's i don't know it's more people i don't know i like it i although i have to say um this time when i went back i forgot how short the trip was on the train because i'm always flying somewhere so i'm really used to like all right this is the last stop everyone you know leaves together don't do this what I did. I almost missed my spot my my stop. Don't wear noise cancellation headphones on, on, on the train. I put it on, I kind of like took a short nap. And then all of a sudden I heard this is the last call for Philadelphia. And I got up and I dropped my laptop. And the guy next to me like picked it up. He and I was like, this is this Philadelphia? He's like, Yeah, this is your laptop. I was like, hold on to it. Let me get my bag. I grabbed my bag and everything, grab the laptop, thank you, and I ran out. So uh make sure at least when I came back, I was like, I'm going to set alarm just so I remember. <laughs> it's so short. Everyone, we're all from East Coast. Go to Philly. I I will. I love this Philly plug. I am all Philly. Yeah, Thank I you. like Philly too. I was yeah. I was there for a little bit, um, went to go visit some friends. And the first thing I noticed were all the cars were parked on the road. But it was like in the median or something like that. And I was like, that, no one's going to like stop them. And then people were like, they don't do that in Philly. They don't care. <laughs> so I was like, I like this place. <laughs> <laughs> Philly's fun. We should do uh, field trips there. Yeah. Yeah. There are great museums and, you know, great food, great people. I went to Barnes Foundation. Have you seen, have you, did you watch that document called Artists the Steel? Go watch mm-hmm. it. That's my homework for you. It's a really cool one. And you can actually see the museum. What's it called again? Barnes Foundation. Barnes Foundation. Okay. Okay. Are you guys ready for our, are you guys ready for our big debate topic? We can wrap this up. With yeah. Okay. So, yeah. uh, as you guys know, if you've been listening for the last couple episodes, we've been trying to, we, we just, we get into such deep conversations and we, and we just wrap them up. We, we, we dive right into them. We wrap them up and, um, you know, we just want to, we just want to have a little bit of fun so we have a uh we have a debate topic today we want to um we want to get your thoughts shung on if you think that a cheesecake is a cake or a pie because i'm kind of torn i'm torn but leaning one way i think I'd... i feel like okay go ahead go ahead no okay i'll okay i'll i i think it's a pie I think that I think that cheesecake is a pie, like genuinely, <laughs> because be, for for one reason, because it has a crust, like yeah, the the it's got a crust. I've never heard of a a cake with a crust, and let's wait. Is the crust all the way to the bottom or just on the side? I feel like I've had or both. Huh. Now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, but how would you hold it? How would it stay, you know, because it's like flimsy kind of. It needs like a crust. Ah. To hold it. Are we changing your mind? 
no, no, no. Because <laughs> in my head, I was like, it's a, it's, I can see in the middle because the crust on the side. But yeah. I don't remember. Because I feel like a, there, a lot of cheesecake that I have, they're not with the bottom, though. Yeah, yeah I kind of think oh, that, too, now that I'm thinking right. about it. Hmm. So it depends on how it's made, right? Yeah, that's maybe that's. I actually the thing. don't know how. It's so, so maybe we we are in agreement. If it's <laughs> if it's wrap around, then it's a pie. But if just the side, then it's a cake. I guess yeah. so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this debate was so easy. Just, I, <laughs> wait a minute. Do you you don't bake cheesecake though, right? I don't. So that, no. but I, I feel like that's another knot. It's a, it's a pie. It's a it's a hundred percent. No, no, but I definitely have cheesecakes without the bottom. That sounds weird. This whole sentence sounds so weird. <laughs> <laughs> no bottom cheesecake. Well, I also bottom think of cheese. this though. Think of um, think of like key lime pie, is like because yeah. isn't it the same thing with cheesecake? I've never made cheesecake, but isn't it just like the filling and then you just kind of let it like rest or like set, set. settle? Yeah, you're not actually like oh, making it or anything. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think cheesecake is made from like Philadelphia cheese, right? <laughs> cheese plug. <laughs> and then, yeah, like you just, you either add, I don't know, you make it thicker or you add more milk to it. But I think yeah, that's it. Like it's not like, it's not on. layered. See, this debatable was too obvious. There's no way, I feel bad if we had to argue for a cake because I'm like, there's, yeah, I support. don't think. Yeah, no. I'm thinking about it. I argument. think it's a pretty dumb. Du- okay, no. but, but here's the thing. Then. No, I'm looking it up. I'm looking. Okay, so this is the diff. This is why I'm just I'm researching photos <laughs> of cheesecake right now. So you're right in terms of uh, the classic cheesecakes actually has that graham cracker bottom, right? But this is where my mind goes because I'm Asian. Japanese key cheesecake actually has no. <laughs> Yep, the crust on the bottom. That's why my head goes like it's a cake because that's the one I have normally. Oh, yeah. So I wonder. So, so I, yeah, I mean, I guess at some point, like I guess what this boils down to is the fact that it's called what it's called. So why is it called a cheese? <laughs> it's called a cheesecake. Where did that come from? Now I'm just I need like a cheesecake history <laughs> lesson. Know, cheesecake. But what, what what else would you cheese pie? Cheese cheese pie. Yeah, that's. I, don't I know think it was a marketer. It must have been a marketer that was like, "Now nah, that doesn't sound." <laughs> no one is buying marketing <laughs> decision. Maybe yeah, I be a pie. It's not key lime cake. True. Cute. Yeah, that doesn't sound. Mm, that's true. Cherry pie, apple pie, apple cake, apple cake. That sounds weird. Yeah. Is this just? Is this purely just a marketing, a marketing decision? <laughs> Have you looked it up and you know see what the internet says? I'm just curious. See what Reddit? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure this has been discussed already on Reddit. Debated. People get hot on it. They're like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> it's this. Oh, okay, so this is from SouthernLiving.com. Given cheesecake structure, ingredients, and then the way it's baked, cooked, and served, we are chiming in to say that. Cheesecake is a hybrid between cake and pie. <laughs> okay, that's the it's easy way, way out. Yeah. The easy way out. Yeah. <laughs> Guess, you know, you're not offending anyone. So, what? actually, someone wrote this another one. This is actually interesting. Hold on. Quote, wait, hold on. The, I just need the quote. Where is the quote? Uh, cheesecake is technically a tart. Uh, wait, what? wait, what's a, I don't... a tart needed a See, fruit? Now we're but... getting into like because baking, <laughs> baking is like a whole like. Don't you need a degree in order to like legally bake? I'm joking. Oh, you mean like? <laughs> I'm yeah. just in general. It's like a don't you need like a <laughs> science or like a physics degree or like <laughs> like people? Yeah, <laughs> like people need. Like baking, <laughs> like you, you like if you have like just a little bit of extra sugar, it turns into a tart versus a versus a. <laughs> they have all these. Things. I mean, that's not like baking though. Baking's like following instructions and you know rules and stuff. It is is very scientific. But when you say do you need a degree, I'm like, did my mom have a degree in baking? Yeah, <laughs> we've all been bit. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. We've been lying. Bro. Yeah, we. <laughs> I watched the Great but British Bake Off. Uh, 
during oh. the holidays. And I was like, man, this is because, you know, the host, uh, his name is Paul Holiday, I believe. They'll mm -hmm. they'll place all of their dishes, whatever the challenge is, whether it was make a cake or make this kind of tart or whatever. And they and they yeah. do like a blind taste test where the judges are eating all the different ones and they don't know who made them. And I'm looking at every single one of them. I'm like, that looks delicious. That looks delicious. That looks delicious. That looks great. I would eat that. And they're eating each one are just like, oh, you know, it's missing the, you know, it's a little too like crispy. Like the bottom is like not as crispy as I would like, but I'm looking at it and I'm like, that looked fine to me. I would have like, <laughs> I would have known. I don't think I've ever had a cheesecake that was like crispier than that. I don't know. <laughs> So it's a whole science. See, it's a whole science, but that's the thing of actually. So I also pick up pottery like a year ago or something. Oh. And for me, pottery is really, uh, I do wheels. So wheels are like baking. You need technique. It's, it's all about structure, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know me by now. I need structure. I need like, I, when I do things, it's, it's more like logic, right? And, uh, and my friends like you need to start doing hem building. So I rent uh, I'm in the studio and there are a lot of people in different levels of experience. This guy was sitting across from me. He's like, oh, that's cool. Oh, I was like painting little flowers. I made this. I was painting little flowers on my cup. And he's like, oh my God, that would be like torture for me. And I looked at him, he was like building like a structure of like a clock tower. <laughs> But hand building, I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so we we're finding the differences. We should challenge each other. I was like, you should try to do well. I will try, you know, hand building because I was telling him like I can't freestyle. I feel like that's if my brain doesn't work. I need a structure. I need give me rules and I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it's something similar to baking is that you have to have follow all these steps. And the amount, if you mess it up, it could be a cake, it could be a tart, it could be a whole disaster, literally. Um, but then I'm also trying to be, I feel like I'm learning in the process of uh, letting things go. Like sometimes you don't need structure. Sometimes going with the flow would be just fine. It's really hard, but I'm trying. So I start hand building a little bit. I made like a, uh, like a sponge, like a dish soap, uh, wait, soap dish. Uh, you, we put the soap on. Uh, I, I I just use it with my hand. I was like, I don't know, it's gonna look like crap. And it came out pretty good. I was like, oh. I walk up to the guy. And I was like, look, I made this. I was and my thing like this tiny. And he's big. He's like, good job. And I was like, thank you. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> he's like, now you can go make a clock. I'm like, nah, I'm here. Oh, man. <laughs> that's cool. yeah, that's fun. You should go do pottery. This is fun. It's on my list. I've always, I just, I like. I don't know. I like, and this may sound weird, but like a couple of days ago, honestly, is it is it weird? Cheesecake is a tart, though. I think you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was honest, honest story. I was, I was walking, um, and I was like, I was just looking at my hands, and I was like, man, wait, how are you walking and looking at your hands at the same time? Sorry, it gets, like walking, it, it, that's down. part of what. <laughs> I was looking down. I don't know. It wasn't like it wasn't like I was staring at him, but I just kind of like looked at him for whatever reason. And I just had the thought. I was like, man, I've like, you know, I've had these hands for 30 years. Like how many, how many things have I made with these or like molded with these or like clicked with these? Um, and then I was just like, oh, you know, like I think of uh like a carpenter or someone who makes pottery, you know, like uses their hands like that every day. I don't know. It was just like a little thought I had. I was like, that's that's amazing. <laughs> Did you go like this? I thank you for all yeah, the hard exactly. work. Yeah, exactly. I was like, thank you, hands. I appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> I like that random thoughts. Question for you too. If mm -hmm. you can choose any character to be your best friend, any characters, who would that be? Hmm. Hmm. Character like from TV shows or it could be anything. It could be a, a movie, yeah. a shows, it could be animated, it could be a person. That's a tough one. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough one. I, I have one. Mine is um uh X Men ninety seven Logan specifically. Oh. Whoa, okay, why? <laughs> Very specific. Oh. So you thought I, about it. No, I th that's always been my character. Um, so when I was a kid, 
um, our neighbor had an X Men Wolverine toy, and we 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 would just play with it by sharing because that's how we had toys. Like we all just shared like a bike, we shared toys, and I just I remember this feeling of just wanting to 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 just take that toy from him so I could play with it all the time. So <laughs> I was like. <laughs> I was like, so I, I still think about that even as a as a thirty two year old man. I'm like, I still want that toy, that specific one from him. I so yeah, that's that. I, like I like your stories not about the character. I was like, this character has like a personality I want to hang out with. No, it's because no. the neighbor had it. I really want. <laughs> I wanted that toy. <laughs> I think I think mine would be Jimmy Neutron. You know, you know Jimmy Neutron. No, he was he was a Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon show um, mm -hmm. from back in the day. And he was this essentially like a boy genius. And like, he had like, he built like a rocket ship that could like fly around. Like he just, built, you know, you remember Jimmy Neutron, right, Jeff? Yeah, he had a huge Yeah, he had like, he had hair that was like head. shaped like a really Like funny. an ice cream. Yeah, he had <laughs> yeah, like, like, like an ice cream. <laughs> and he was this, this boy genius. And I just think like, you know, he in the show he had best friends. He had Sheen and Carl, <laughs> yeah. and I just remember just like, yo, if I was, if I was his best friend, I would have so much fun. Like they go on the funnest like adventures. Mm. Yeah, they, he just makes like, I just go over Jimmy's house all the time. <laughs> That's so fun. Uh, what about you? Mine, I don't know if you know, apparently this cartoon is banned in the United States. I just, I, I found that out. Uh, Doraemon, mm -hmm. you know, that ro yeah, the yeah. robot cat, like a round head, a round body, mm -hmm. and he can pull oh. images from his pockets. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. That was awesome. the, oh. I, I'm going to date myself. I, when I started watching cartoons, I was watching on VHS. <laughs> so my mom would take me to a big rental place and now I'll watch I think there's only two episodes on one VHS. I'll just like keep repeating it and watching it over and over again. Because for me, it was like, I want a cat. It says so much about us. I was like, I want a cat. Could it help me out with all the problems I have? And he could just pull out like anything from his pocket. It's like, if you want to travel the world, he will give you a door. It literally opened the door and you go to the other side. That's like where you want to go. And uh, there's also one gadget. like, I wanted it so bad when I was in school. It's called Memory Bread. Uh, so... So this is part of the reason why it's been United States is because the main character, the little boy, he's so bad at school, like, or, or just, uh, you know, not good at anything. So the cat is the one like solving all his problems. So <laughs> this kid is really bad in school. So he's like, I have a test tomorrow. I can't memorize anything. So the cat is like, all right, here's a memory <laughs> bread. So you just paste it on the book imprinted on the bread and you eat it and you memorize everything oh. so in some way they don't want to teach the kids like you know you skip all the steps yeah. you know you can you know, be in school by learning you know eating the bread um but yeah i really wanted that cat so bad um but then this cat also has a time machine actually this cat is from the future from 20th century or 21st century and travel to that time period and helping this kid and so he has his time machine is in the drawer when i was in third grade one of the kid in my class he claimed he had the time machine at his house somehow we all believed in him and we're like can we go hang out he's like no it's under repair he apparently crashed in my house and we're trying to fix it for the whole third actually fourth grade I was like under an impression this guy for sure had a time machine at his house. <laughs> I completely forgot about it. And I got reconnected with this guy recently, but I have yet to have the courage to ask him, why'd you lie to us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or. Well, that was a highlight for a whole year for us. We were like, we all became so good friends with him. Like, can we go hang out, please? No. I would have been, I would have, don't worry. I would have believed him too. <laughs> Right. Like, but I like how our stories are so different, Jeffrey, because your neighbor. My neighbor. I still think about it. I went when I went to my grandma's. I was I was like, I wonder if he's still there. Like that's how much I thought about it. I was like, but 
But do you sure. consider yourself your your you and the neighbor good friends or more like rivals? No, we were friends. I think it was like, oh, everyone lives in this neighborhood, so we all talk to each other. Okay. He just he just had it, Every, and everyone you know in grade that. school is your friend. If I know you, you're my friend. Yes. <laughs> That's true. See, networking mm-hmm. is so not an issue when you're in grade school. Bring it back. <laughs> I love it. Full sir cycle. I love it. This is amazing. <laughs> Shung, thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. I love this conversation. Thank yeah. you for having me. Sorry, I went like so many different directions no. in one podcast. <laughs> but thank you. Now I know a lot about you two and also Cheesecake. So thank you for enlightening me about all this new <laughs> knowledge that I never had before. Mm-hmm. Anything, yes. anything, um, anything else you want to mention? Anything you got going on or? Plugs. plugs. If, if people want to reach out to you or plugs, you know. yes. Uh, yeah. There's so many plugs I could do, but I think one thing I would say, actually, back to what Jeffrey, you're talking about confidence. Uh, a huge struggle that I have for years is I run the scholarship program for WIA, and I don't have enough people applying for it. I mean, not enough. It just every year I raise more money or software, hardware, whatever that is. People are not lying. So it's, again, I think is it is a confidence issues. And sometimes I'll run into students like, how come you're not applying? They're like, well, my work is not good enough. <sighs> so if I can plug anything is, there are a lot of resources out there for any challenges you might have. There's a lot of organizations out there. Um, and I would say, don't be shy about reaching out and don't be shy about presenting yourself to the world because you have to, like, that's how we meet people, right? And also, please apply for my scholarship program. <laughs> 100%. It's money and software and hardware and mentoring programs, you know? So um, if you if I can pluck that, I will. that will be the one. So thank you for letting me share this. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, send send us the link and we'll and we'll include it in the show notes too for anyone interested. I will do that. Thank you. Well, oh, let's go out and touch some grass. Yeah. It's really nice today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, go talk to strangers. I'm gonna go. I love it. That's a that's a new one. I'm gonna start doing more. Usually it's just touching grass, but I'm like, okay, I need to actually talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go talk to somebody. <laughs> One last homework, since we're talking about your best friend as a character, or your character as your best friend, we should also think about a dark secret that this character has and no one else knew but you. Ha! We don't have to share it right now, just think about it. I'm I'm gonna think about it. James, James Isaac Neutron. I have to, (laughs) I'm gonna have to go back and watch, watch his material. (laughs) No, you did that, because, because there's some secret you never share that would be fun exercise for storytelling we'll think about it we'll think think no thank you sean thank you so much thank you you have a good one happy animation everyone bye peace